Welcome, folks, to another episode of the Work Item. Today, I have Brian Douglas. Welcome, Brian. Hi, welcome. Thank you very much for having me on the uh, the podcast show. I'm very excited to be learning about developer relations from you because I, you know, when I think developer relations, the first thing that pops into mind is like Brian knows the answer to this. So, uh, Brian, why don't you tell us more about what you're doing these days? Yeah, well, that's very, very flattering. Uh, I feel like I'm, I'm still figuring everything out as I go along. This happened to be very happy to share tips and tricks as I, as I figure them out. But um, your question was what I do now, uh, what I'm doing these days. Uh, at the moment, I am a director of developer advocacy at GitHub. And um, what that means is uh, I lead uh, a handful of developer advocates and we engage our users um, and teach them how to how to use different things on GitHub. Uh, and that's sort of like, we'll probably get into this, but it kind of shows itself in many different ways, blog posts, YouTube videos, uh, very recently, TikToks and Twitter spaces. So we kind of just try a bunch of this different stuff. Wow, so you're on the cutting edge of community engagement. So let's talk about your role. So director of developer advocacy, like what what is that about? Because again, you mentioned it's a very broad space. There's so much stuff to do. What's the role of a director in that in that kind of context. Yeah, yeah. And this is something I've always thought about because so I, uh, zooming back out, um, I started at GitHub as the first advocate. Uh, we'd had other people who advocated GitHub, uh, a lot of like uh, Matthew McCullough and, and Tim uh, Bergen, Ber uh, Berglund. Uh, anyway, Tim, uh, they're in like the earliest Git videos, also um, Scott Chacon. So like all sort of the, uh, the predecessors, folks have done the advocate work, uh, but didn't actually have the, the title. They kind of had like these hybrid roles. Um, so I joined at a time where we had a lot of success in the education side. So we had a lot of quote unquote advocates working with our students uh, and that leveraged GitHub and they wanted to start DevRel at GitHub proper. Uh, so I joined and um, so in, I already forgot the, the original question. <laughs> Well, we're talking about the role of the d director of developer advocacy. Yes, the director role. I was going to talk about more about advocate, but let's talk about director. So when I joined, I was pretty autonomous. I had I actually had a director, but uh, with an advocate, there's like so much self-starting that happens that uh, you kind of just want to, you have an idea, you run with it. Um, so I know there's developer relations managers and like I don't want to like draw hot takes, but I don't know how much, how useful having a manager versus the director is because like a director is a, it's a manager of managers. Uh, so the idea is like that folks that report to me, they could potentially run entire programs, like engagement opportunities, and they don't need my oversight. And so as a director, I kind of just throw, I, I call these things idea grenades, um, where I just have an idea and I'll just drop it uh, in a conversation and like anybody can pick it up uh, and run with it, whatever they want to do. Um, but the hope is that these like positive ideas that we have uh, about how we engage our community, uh, people can just pick those up and essentially run with it. I, I essentially said that twice, but y'all know what I mean. Speaking of developer advocacy, because and you kind of touched on that, the, the role of just developer advocates in an organization, what do they do? Because, you know, if I think about developer advocacy as a role, it's been added to a lot of organizations nowadays. So GitHub, yeah. Microsoft, Amazon, you name it, you name a company and it's, Fairly recent, right? Like if yeah. we think about the the evolution of the role, definitely in the last five years. Right, right. Uh, tell me more. What do you see as kind of the responsibility of developer advocates? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a good question too, as well. And you mentioned some large companies, but I've seen more and more small startups hire developer advocates early on. Um, and like the the role kind of fits. It's like this hybrid role of folks who can talk on stage in front of camera, write blog posts. You don't have to do all of it, but you're good at maybe one or two of those things. Uh, but also most likely probably going to write some code. That's also not a requirement. And it's like this, it's similar like developers. Like if I don't know how to write SQL queries, um, it doesn't mean I'm not a good developer. If I don't know how to like work on APIs and maintain those securely, it doesn't mean I'm a bad developer. And I think with an advocate, if you don't know how to be, like host a podcast, or if you don't know how to give a talk on stage, it doesn't necessarily mean you're a bad developer advocate. So like it's pretty fluid. And I think a lot of people try to put boxes on like what an evangelist is, what an advocate is, what a dev experience person is. Uh, and I think actually the developer experience thing is a whole other conversation which we can get into. But um, an advocate, like their job is really to engage community, engage, uh, and I don't even use the word customer because a lot of what I engage at GitHub are our free users. So my focus is really open source because a lot of the folks who engage GitHub for the first time uh, either come to like a free tutorial 
or a Stack Overflow question, or somebody says, sign up for a GitHub account, you're going to need it later. Uh, so then we kind of spent a lot of time talking to these sort of, uh, we call it internally early stage developers. So people who have a GitHub account, but don't quite know exactly what they need to do. Uh, we engaged them by showing them, hey, did you know you can actually leverage GitHub issues to ask questions? Maybe in the, but then the other question, the other half of that is like, maybe don't use a GitHub issue to ask questions. How do you distinguish in a repository which one is, is the right way? If they have GitHub discussions or if they have pull requests, like how do you, what are the best practices for interacting with this repository? And it's like information you don't really always get, even when you join a team. I've, I've met so many engineering teams, especially at smaller companies who have GitHub organizations, but they're not using pull requests or they have GitHub orgs but they don't open issues or they don't actually do proper planning and tracking of features. It is kind of this throw stuff in like Google docs and say, good luck. Wow. Uh, and this is where the developer advocates essentially shine the light on the capabilities of the product on the capabilities of the platform. Yeah. Why is it important then to have developer advocates on the team? Because for a lot of the things that we're discussing, I've heard this opinion several times, like, well, you know, just have product managers do it. You know, product managers talk to customers because they need to understand the problem space. What's kind of that Venn diagram look like? Because I've, I feel like there's some overlap, but yeah. there is a distinct developer advocate value prop that you bring to your team. Yeah, yeah. And I would say like with developer relations, which that's what we call our team, um, they can sit in a normal, like a bunch of different places. So like when I first joined GitHub, developer relations was in marketing. Uh, so the way we, 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 we operated was very much like marketing. We'd sponsor conferences. We'd create these like cool, like content opportunities and engage with our, some, a lot of our free users and do a lot of partnership and stuff like that. Um, but then there's also DevRel teams that also sit inside of engineering, which means they just need to have a story. Uh, that can be sold or not even sold, but like shared with their users. Because a lot of times I have a very specific example. When I sat at my previous employer, I was an engineer. Uh, I was kind of doing DevRel on the side, like writing blog posts and stuff like that. And I was shipping a feature and we got to the point where the feature was like basically done. And we sat around and was like, okay, when well, we ship this on Monday, um, then we'll basically uh, move on to these features. And I, I raised my hand and asked this question. I was like, do we even know like if people want this feature? Like that's, that's a really good question to ask. And it, not a great question to ask like on a Friday before we ship something on a Monday, but like, how do we know we're going to use it? And it, long story short, no one used the feature. Like it was kind of a dud. Um, and I spent all this time working on it, but there was like no story. It was like, why would you do, why would you use this feature in, in any context? Like, why would you use pull request if you're a solo developer? Uh, what, like it doesn't make sense why you would do that, but I've got a story to share on why you would do that because I've got an open source project that had no contributors, no users. And one day I got contributors and users. It took years, but eventually people found the project. And then they had a bunch of questions. And all I, all I had was answers because all the knowledge was up here. But if I did pull requests and I cut releases and create proper documentation the entire time when no one was paying attention, then it would be easier to answer those questions. But I, I learned the hard way because I was only one working in this repo Everybody had all these questions. I had, I had the answers, but I had to like eventually figure out how to get documentation and share these answers in a way that I didn't have to answer them every single time someone joined the project. So I'm curious, you mentioned something at the very beginning that DevRel can sit in marketing and it can sit outside of marketing. Is one of the models better than the other? Because it seems that if one sits in marketing, your number one goal would be to upsell. Right, like yeah. make sure that you get the product out and get new customers versus non-marketing. That seems like your incentives would be different. Like, is, is there one better than the other? Yeah, and it, it really comes down to like the life cycle of your product and where you sit. There's no, so I'm gonna basically say it depends. That's like a kind of a cop out. But in marketing, you can guarantee you have money. So when I, when I joined GitHub and we joined uh, the marketing org to do DevRel, uh, we had an, basically an unlimited budget, like within reason. If we wanted to go sponsor RailsCon or PyCon or something like that, there was no questions asked. But as we moved into the product org, now we have more of like a, a, we actually had a budget and then we had like, we had these products and these features that we're actually focusing on each quarter uh, that needs a little more effort. So if we're going to RailsConf, how are we talking about GitHub Actions at RailsConf? And that's like a, a real question that was proposed when we decided that we weren't gonna sponsor RailsConf uh, back in 2019, uh, actually in 2020. Um, 
which eventually 2020 rails comp was completely different because of, of reasons but we made the decision not to sponsor rails comp in 20, uh, 2020 uh because we didn't really have a really strong story with github actions in ruby developers or rails developers um so like that was like the decision that that was made and like we have eventually had strong stories that were created but then the question is asked like can i leverage my community to help with the story like i can engage rails developers i can engage github engineers to help with that story um so like if you could do it github basically the reason why we're in product and the reason why our we have a realistic budget and everything like that is because github doesn't have an awareness problem like people know github so like if i was working at a, a smaller company and we had just to get the name out in front of people and i would mention you know the company i work for which i've done so far multiple times during this podcast like i need to be make people aware of why i'm here and what what company i work for but the approach of GitHub, specifically in the GitHub DevRel team, is that we already assume you have a GitHub account, which is, it's a, a, a space that we could operate in because we just, we've done a lot of research. And I think it's very apparent that people have GitHub accounts. Uh, and we have an education team that educates people in the early stage developer aim. And so now we can basically start with, okay, well, we're going to assume you already even know Git. Like you probably already have that, that box checked. Or if you don't, we're not going to lean too heavily on Git. Like the way we talk about our features as a DevRel team, we talk about it as if you already gone through step one, two, three. Uh, and if the question comes to step one, two, three, then we know, okay, there's a good signal. We should probably do some beginner focused content. So that way we don't have a struggle with new users trying to understand what we're talking about. So you mentioned DevRel at the early stage is completely different than DevRel at the later stage. But again, it totally makes sense. And what is kind of the, the strategy that you've seen work when you do need to build that awareness that, you know, you're working for some startup or company that is not GitHub, that doesn't have that instant name recognition. You're like, wait, who are you working again for? Like, never heard of it. How do you get that name out there as a DevRel person? That's that's a great question. This is like all the secret sauce that I've, I've been doing DevRel for about four years professionally at GitHub. And then I did about a year at a company called Netlify. And Netlify was a small company that we had to basically do the bottom-up strategy. And it's a decision you have to make pretty early on. And this is why I see a lot more DevRel folks get hired early on at companies, uh, which is the bottom-up. So like you think about GitHub, GitHub... Um, go through the history books or go through Twitter and stuff like that and learn about GitHub's history. But what they really figured out is bottom up strategy and bottom up adoption. So like GitHub just became the cool way to collaborate in code uh, that everybody was using it. Like it was kind of this, the, the no brainer. And I think they really, uh, I actually gave a DevRelCon talk about this um, specifically around GitHub's adoption and their stickers and their swag. Uh, and which is like a lot of people want to go stickers and swag up front. But I think what GitHub really did is they really just focused on one community, which was the community that they used to build GitHub, which was the Ruby on Rails community that had a, a, a ginormic, like a, a rise into like prominence of how people leverage web apps and how they built them. Uh, it wasn't this, it wasn't the one framework to solve all problems, but it was the one that solved GitHub's problem. So if you could get your own community with the Rails community, like embedded, which was at the time it was, I, I don't mean to speak it this way, but like essentially it was like hipster developers, folks who weren't specifically all CS grads, but they were like folks who kind of were self-taught and liked the edgier style of what GitHub was doing. And then eventually you're, a couple years later, they had a, a mascot. The mascot kind of drove into like the swag and the sticker game. So this is what we did, exactly what we did at Netlify. At the point where you start bringing in enterprise customers and having that conversation, uh, it becomes an easy conversation because if you're talking to the CTO and they're like, hey, you should sign up for GitHub. Um, and they're like, yeah, we've heard of GitHub. All of our engineers have been asking us to have this meeting. And then at that point, it's like, okay, well, how much, how much, how many engineers? Like, here's where you sign type of deal. And like, this is a, I, I don't sit on in sales conversations at GitHub, but uh, I did sit in sales conversations at, at Netlify. And that was a conversation that Netlify was getting, which like, you sat, sit at the desk with like these important people and they already love Netlify because the the DevRel engagements, the community engagements, it empowered all the engineers to speak up and say, hey, we want, this is what we want to use. It's interesting because this can apply specifically to any developer tool ever because developers will start experimenting with stuff on their own, be it a new text editor. I remember at some point, uh, I'm, at GitHub, it was Adam, the, the editor, back in the day, way before VS Code, 
when it was one of those things that developers just started kind of using it themselves. It was not like a CTO mandate that everyone switches to. Atom. It's just like, it's a cool editor. It gets the job done. It's fast and it's cross-platform. Why wouldn't I use it? Yeah, yeah. It's it's the um, the word of mouth. And like, I go in this like a lot of, a lot of detail. Um, the approach of how dev tool companies are sort of going to conferences and engaging the individual developers and just empowering them to make the like the influence of decisions inside of companies. It's just what you see with punk rock uh, and how it becomes like more of like an underground thing and then eventually becomes a mainstream thing. But that sort of uptick to become mainstream, uh, it takes it takes a bit of time, but it's a lot of convincing like this. These are the bands to listen to. This is this is the type of music that's going to be, you know, that's going to speak to you. And I think where GitHub, their their influence really came through like a punk rock angle and like punk rock re will replace the genre of music with whatever you want. But it, it was essentially like, you know how to talk to the kids and what's up and coming. And I think with dev tools, I think what's happening now is that um, actually just in general in the dev rel space, there's a shift from where, where the focus is right now. Uh, and I think a lot of people are kind of like doing a bit of a land grab and, and capturing in spaces because like, you asked about DevRel, like what we do. Most of what we did was go travel to conferences and speak on stage. And that completely got turned upside down in 2020. So if there are no conferences and there are no stages, what are we doing? And if you looked at any DevRel folks and like this is going to be hosted on YouTube after the fact, like look at all the DevRel people on YouTube now. Uh, look at all the YouTube people who are now DevRel on DevRel teams. That has completely turned the entire industry uh, a little upside down a bit. Uh, because now you can't count on, like we just had KubeCon last week. Um, I'm really happy that that conference is back now in San Diego uh, at the time of this recording, but the we can't count on all the conferences coming back. Even O'Reilly's conferences are now no longer, they're null and void. They're coming back undefined because they're no longer going to ship conferences. So if I can't count on that, now I have to create all these spaces. And uh, so that, which I was alluding to, which is, now you're creating these YouTube channels. Now we're now you see DevRel teams paying attention to YouTube and um, live streaming and all these other channels, and even making attempts at hosting their own conferences as well, Rem remote specifically. Right. It's an interesting change that um, you know you can't. And, and this is another part probably that is very critical when you're talking about online communities and online engagement is that authenticity for developer relations because you can no longer, you know, it's not about swag. It's not about you know, the, the upsell, it's more about why would I watch this video of this one person talking? Yeah. And authenticity is something that I always, uh, a lot of folks ask if you need to be a developer to become a developer advocate. And, uh, it's so much easier to be authentic to developers when you actually understand their pain, understand the pain point of signing up for things and not knowing what the next step is. So many de developer tools I've signed up for, and I see like a blank terminal screen. And then I have to now know exactly what commands to drop in there. Or I didn't know about Docker Compose files, and that becomes like the central place of how all these sort of GitOps tools are now running and all these YAML files. If I don't have any of that context, I don't know where to start. And no one's really advocating for me as I know how to write code. I know how to get a web app up. I don't know how to ship this in production. And there's a lot of like backroom deals, handshakes that I, I just wasn't privy to. Uh, and the companies that continue to uh, widen the gates, as opposed to, as uh, as opposed to like specifically, if you don't use Kubernetes, you can't come in this door. Like you see less and less of an emphasis on Kubernetes. Like that's not going away, but you're now you're seeing a, a basically a, a layer of product UI on top of that. So that way you never have to touch Kubernetes, but you can take advantage of it um, until forever. And this is something that you touched on early in the podcast and you talked about developer experience. And I want to learn more from you on how do developer advocates in those situations where you have this blank terminal screen advocate for a better developer experience? And what is a better developer experience? Yeah, so like uh, I'm, a, I'm a power GitHub user. I've got over 500 repositories because why not? Like I'm not paying for any of that. And uh, when I worked at Netlify, I'm a previous employer. I had like over 200 sites. I was a power user there. And um, the one thing I realized uh, at Netlify, at previous companies, is that very few of the engineers use the product as heavily as like I do, because uh, I want to I want to understand the user. I want to understand what, what I'm making features for. Uh, so like before Netlify worked at an education startup, 
I, I went through those courses. I, I learned how to write different like iOS programs and stuff like that and, and apps because that's what they were offering. And at Netlify, I shipped a lot of features as an engineer, but I also knew how to talk about those features uh, in public like as well. I was like, I wasn't a marketer. I just knew how to like engage developers the way that I would want to be engaged. So if uh, we, we spent a lot of time that same summer, we shipped a feature no one used. Uh, we also shipped a feature that tons of people use, which is a Netlify deploy button. And it's just a simple button that sits inside a GitHub repo that deploy, when you click that button, it deploys a clone of that repo up on Netlify and then also creates a clone under your account. So that way you have the code. So this whole ecosystem of templates, like this completely took off. So when you see it, like talk about Netlify is crossing 2 million developers or users worldwide. At the time, we had like maybe 200,000, not even 200,000, like 20,000, I think it was like the number. And um, yeah, it was like my first my first year at Nullify. And I spent a lot of time in, in the open source space. And I spent a lot of time building like really quick websites and ideas and like, because I just had a bunch of ideas as a developer. And I would use these templates and then I would just add a Netlify deploy button. So that way when I was on stage or in a blog post talking about, hey, I built this like restaurant site. Uh, if you want one of these, just click this button and you've got the same code and run with it, do whatever you want. MIT license, I don't care. Uh, and it's just kind of took off like where people are now, this entire ecosystem of people creating templates and actually uh, StackBit, uh, which is a whole nother startup that, and also Sanity and tons of other startups who build these templates that deploy to Netlify with ease. So again, small change, but because you build that understanding of the customer and then you advocate indirectly by, you know, essentially follow what I do, not what I say. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's the, um, if you're a developer and you work on a, a product and the best thing you can do is actually use it. And it's like mind boggling that I can, like people will spend years working at a company, which like, you don't have to be in love with the products. You don't have to be an expert. But just using it changes your entire perspective on like where to put things on the dashboard, even push back as an engineer, like being able to advocate for like, you know what, I've been using this thing for six months and I still can't find out how to do, you know, the one thing that I, everybody wants to do. Like, for example, YouTube, one thing that, I, that kind of annoys me so much is I have a YouTube channel and every time I go to YouTube, all I want to go is my, stu my, my YouTube studio and like quickly go upload like subtitles or something. And what's really annoying is every time I go to my channel, it's, it shows me my channel. It starts auto playing videos. And I'm like, this is not what I want. I want to actually go to the actual studio part. So it'd be great if I could just like the drop down, go to YouTube studio and that exists now. Uh, but it didn't always exist in the drop down under your, your face. And it's like, those are the pain points that I'm just constantly like, at the moment, I've got some ideas for the GitHub product and I just drop them in Slack messages. I open up issues because we use GitHub as a whole across the board for everything. So if I have an idea, I'll just be a, Hey PM, uh, you probably know me because most people at, at GitHub are familiar with who I am. Um, cause I do DevRel, which is a whole nother conversation. Like as DevRel, you probably should know even your own engineers, um, uh, because that way those are also people you should be advocating for as well, uh, because they're shipping stuff. Uh, so yeah, I pitch ideas and I try to see, get, get things in the, uh, the UI. This is also a fascinating aspect of the developer relations work is actually being hands-on with the products that you're building. Because as a product person, I've seen this one too many times where you get excited about the feature as a product person, you get excited about a feature as an engineer, you ship it, and then you're like, all right, now I'm going next to the, whatever feature is in the backlog without actually spending time using it and putting yourself in the customer's shoes. And then six months later, you realize, hold on a second, this actually, the end-to-end the -end experience is actually kind of crappy. So like specifically, there's one feature that I can't claim that it's it's a feature I, I am empowered or whatnot, but I, I one thing I, I hate doing all the time is when I go to work on open source, you fork the repo, uh, and then from the fork of the repo, you then clone that. But when you clone that, you also want access to the upstream. So the thing you forked from, because you want to always pull changes, uh, you want to keep that up to date. Well, that was, that was a pain point so much that I built in a GitHub action to basically anybody who clones my project, uh, it's going to keep your, your fork up to date. And what I ask for everybody who contributes is don't touch the, the main branch or the head branch, uh, because that's going to always have changes updated and you'll always have the latest and greatest because everybody who contributes to my side project, which is open source, uh, they will always delete the fork, refork it, and then make their change. So that way you just lose all your work that you've done 
uh, and you would just start over. Uh, so GitHub now has a button that's once you fork it and it gets out of sync, you just click the button. It says fetch from upstream. So you can just do that right in the UI. You don't have to clone it and do all that dancing and uh, the pulling from upstream and merging from, from the main branch and all that stuff. It's just click the one button. You're good. And I love that about GitHub that there is these little nice to haves, but they're kind of life changing. And I think it's called project paper cuts, right? There's a, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Changes get aggregated. Yeah. It, it's funny that, um, uh, we, we've we've definitely mentioned that uh, in, in public, never on stage, but uh, yeah, it is definitely called project paper cuts because there are small features that usually a lower tier that are like, they probably spent a couple of weeks on like understanding the the customer pain point taking, like we actually have a, a repo called feedback. So github.com slash github slash feedback. Anybody who uses GitHub can put feedback on like, hey, I have an idea for a feature or this is a pain point. This is my repo. Could you fix this? We don't necessarily answer all those, uh, but there's a lot of good ideas there. So all those like small things that we can just pick up with the one, maybe an engineering team has a couple weeks between, so GitHub Universe is next week. Um, in between GitHub Universe and Thanksgiving, it's gonna be a pretty slow time for us because uh, we're all shipping a bunch of features next week. Um, so we have this downtime. So teams can go pick up some paper cuts and like ship stuff that people have been asking for, we can test it uh, and then eventually have that in front of people. I'm excited about Universe because I think the last one I attended in person was the one in 2018. And time okay. Flies. Yeah, that was a while ago. It was a while ago, and it was actually in person. I'm like, <laughs> what is in person events? But I do have uh, the next question tying into what we just talked about is that there's a lot of moving pieces in shipping any product. There's engineers, designers, developer advocates. How do developer advocates collaborate with developers and product teams? to influence the roadmap because it's easy to say, Hey, engineer X, can you build this feature? Because this customer is having a pain point. It's much harder yeah. to build that influence. is kind of like a flywheel where you're constantly pushing for these changes, better developer experiences and so on. Yeah. And I, I think it actually starts with uh, probably where people probably aren't even thinking. Uh, when you say info, like customers having a pain point, you kind of have to have some go-to customers. And a lot of this looks like MVP programs, like Microsoft has MVP program. GitHub has to get up stars. Uh, we also talk to open source maintainers regularly. So a lot of the biggest projects you've heard of, we actually chat with all those maintainers uh, and just get ideas for things that they have pain point on, things that they'd love to see, things that they've seen in other products. Uh, and this basically just get, to get their stories and digest them in something that's like shippable into an issue. Um, so by having like our known customers or actors, which we, we tend to cycle through like different maintainers we talk to or different stars every year. So like make sure we get a good diverse group each year, not the same 10 people every year. Uh, but with that being said, collect these stories, ask these questions, because a lot of times you'll get random stuff on Twitter and you'll get random stuff in like the feedback repo. Uh, and you can't really chase all of that. But what I like to do is actually take the stuff that comes up there and present it in front of the customers, my MVPs, my, my stars, Ask them, hey, is this something you see? Like, and is, is this like a, a context that happens to you? Like, what do you think about this? And like, well, I haven't seen it, but you know, so and so saw it. Can you, you want to do a meeting with them or like have them comment on the the issue or whatever? Like, yeah, it'd be cool. That'd be great. I'd love to have more context, more story to share. And then once you've sort of collected the sort of the pain points, the storytelling aspect of it, then what I usually do, which I don't usually go directly to the product team, I actually try to solve it myself. Uh, so if there's a workaround, there's some documentation that needs to be updated, I can talk to the docs team. If there's a GitHub action, so like the, the beauty of GitHub actions is that it's um, a set of primitives that gives anybody who wants to integrate on GitHub access to do on their own things. So like that fetch from upstream thing that I mentioned, I built a GitHub action to solve that problem because it was one of my problems. It was a problem I got from other customers. Uh, so I solve it pretty poorly, sometimes really hacky. And then once I've solved it, then I go back to the product team, like, hey, we've been using this thing. Here's all the users using this action. Here's like the, the story that we got to this point. I'll go give a talk on it internally. I'll maybe speak about it at GitHub Universe uh, with a sort of like call to action is like, we finally shipped the feature to solve this entire problem. There you go, customers. Now we have an entire end to end story. And this is where the pushback comes from engineers and say, actually, you know what? We have data that proves you otherwise. How do you handle that? Yeah, yeah. And I, I've definitely gotten that before too, as well. Like the, uh, I've worked closely with the CLI team with some of the changes we've had in the last year. And I, I just have ideas so like the fetch for upstream thing. Uh, I actually pitched the CLI team. So the GitHub CLI team um, on solving it 
and like with their range of tools they could do because like now we can do extensions with their uh with the product so i was thinking like oh gh repo fetch from upstream or whatever it is like it would have been great uh, and their pushback was like yeah this would be cool but like this actually needs to go higher up in the chain so which eventually gave us our button um that actually shows up in the ui the ui um, one of the biggest users of the github api uh is the github engineer team so like the ui make in order to make that work we have an internal api that actually makes that work that they can talk to the, the coi team and then that eventually works so a lot of times they'll have conversations that don't really necessarily end up like with the, the directly responsible people that are in that conversation it gets passed down the chain stuff fall on the floor that definitely happens sometimes but it's my my role to advocate for some of these ideas and actually go to bat for them so like that's part of the reason why i built sort of these hacky solutions or I build like a whole conference talk or a YouTube series of like how to solve problems with the tools we have today, because like, I know down the road, we could, we can solve this problem. We just have to have enough of a story to tell. Um, and that's usually how you get buy-in. It's like having the story, having the top maintainers have the sort of experiences that they share with us. So it seems like you're doing quite a bit with your teams. How do you measure impact for developer advocates? Because this is where, when we're talking to product teams, you can say, well, I can bring in the data on the feature usage. When you talk to engineers, you can measure bug fixes and the velocity and you know lines of code, which is a vanity metric, totally get it. Um, for developer advocates, it seems a little more foggy as in you're like, yeah, there's kind of a lot of stuff. What's, what's your approach to that? I used to joke all the time and I have a serendipity index. I was like, you go to a conference, you speak on stage, you talk to a couple people and you go back and you write up a report of like, hey, this is a serendipity that happened because we went to this event. No plan going in, but just had like some things that happened that who knew that you'd meet, you'd meet the CTO of this company who now is going to be on stage at GitHub Universe. So like I try not to over index on serendipity anymore. That was more of like a, a, a naive approach. Um, but the impact, it's, it's something that another thing I try to avoid as well. And I'll talk about what we actually do, but is try to count numbers. So like, for example, this YouTube video is going to go live. Uh, I'll probably mention it to my team, like, hey, we did this. I did this interview. Maybe you all want to check it out. Uh, and then hopefully thousands and thousands of people watch this. And I can tell my team, thousands and thousands of people watched it. We promoted it on this channel and that channel. I also wrote a blog post about it uh, to share my thoughts. And then I could say, okay, then we boosted the 5,000 views. And realistically, the views is not what matters. And I think a lot of times as, as folks who do marketing and folks who do advocacy, uh, the hyper focus on like vanity metrics, like views and shares and likes and retweets, uh, which retweets actually matter, but it's more about the engagement. So like how many comments or how many questions are below this video right now asking for a follow-up about what I mentioned, or maybe something I mentioned, mentioned tongue in cheek, like you were talking about dev, dev experience. Like now we have three more comments about dev experience below. Take those questions and what are we going to do with those questions? How do we answer those questions? Well, we're not just going to comment, like we'll comment, but then should we create a series about what's, what is DevRel, like GitHub? Like, should we answer all those questions? And like that becomes, this conversation becomes another, like a branching effect, uh, legit branching, not just Git branch, um, of more stuff that we could actually engage with. So like, like sort of really having a hard example is the thing I do every Friday, which is open source Friday. I do a live stream. Uh, with the open source maintainer, uh, and it's usually an up and coming project. Projects people are uh, it's on the trending page. People want to talk about or talk talk up uh, talk through and get engagement from. Uh, the maintainer wants to get some exposure because like they're they're on their up and they want to get issues, collaboration solved and stuff like that. Ask questions. Uh, so that's the platform. Now, at the very first like first time we did it, we had like I think over 150 people show up because we had Next.js um, as our first guest. And uh, so Tim was on there. Obviously, Next.js is a popular project. They brought their people. The next one we had, we had 26 people show up. So if we completely focused on like just how many people show up to the live stream, then we're to be like, oh, you know what? The next one only had 10 people. We should probably kill this uh, and move on, do something else different. But what I found was if I over, if I stopped paying attention to who showed up when, like I, I did better at the marketing, do tweets and stuff like that and post the stuff on YouTube so that way people can find it later on. The real focus is the people sitting next to me, the actual maintainer, because those are the projects that eventually, as I mentioned, my MVP group, open source maintainers that we chat with, like it's, 
yes, I can go reach out to Evan Yu and talk about Vue, but like Evan has a whole team. Like, how do I engage the rest of the Vue team and get their answers and their questions? Well, I invite them to Open Source Friday. And how do I get like the up and coming projects? So like there are a couple of projects that kind of really took off in the last year, like uh, Astro being one of them. Uh, Astro is like static site generator. Uh, it's only been around for four months, but it's actually, a, it's really explosive when it comes to first time contributors, uh, people building new sites. Like, I don't know if it's going to be around out there a year from now, but it's a project we should like have a connection to. So having those connections, inviting them to this platform, which is Open Source Friday, it's less about the numbers and it's more about having a Rolodex of people we can talk to in the future. So when we have GitHub Universe, a lot of our speakers are coming from Open Source Friday. Uh, a lot of the, the attendees and the workshop uh, folks, they're also from Open Source Friday. And it's because I have a, a because I just 52 weeks in a year, I don't do it every week. So we got about 40 guests every year. Uh, that we can chat to and introduce to product managers. We can introduce to engineers. We can invite them to come work at GitHub. Like we have job opportunities all the time, which is not one of my goals or metrics. But if people want to work at GitHub uh, or if people are looking for good engineers solving problems, I've got a whole list of folks that I meet with every week. And then we take care of by answering their questions and having follow-up conversations even after the fact. So like impact is less about views. It is more about who is who has the the stories that we could share on stage who has the stories that we could share to our product team to then ship our next features and that's kind of the, the whole reason behind all this and i also i speak from i want to also mention i speak from a place of privilege like github has 65 million users worldwide i can go into a maintainer's email and ask them to come join me and they'll say yes not every project can do this so like we have a different approach to doing this, but I think everybody can probably get something very similar. Like even if it's a, a smaller scale, like it, they can do something where they can just build a platform for other people to share about themselves, but also that you, the product team could also talk to. So in an overly reductive way, you and your team are kind of the glue between the product and the communities. This is kind of what brings people together, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, we're, we're a, a big slab of that glue. So like we do have a community team, uh, folks who hang out in the forums and chat. Uh, we do have a product team. Uh, we have a community team, actually an engineering team uh, called Communities. And their whole thing is like discussions and get up sponsors and they work on those, those platforms and they engage directly with our customers uh, in a sense. So like we, we fill in gaps that are needed. So like we don't spend a, a ton of time uh, with the folks who uh, are using discussions and, and get up sponsors. Because uh, the community team has a really good structure and can get customer feedback. But we do also introduce new customers who need to have questions and stuff like that to that. Um, so I joke a lot internally about uh, the DevRel team is the Hype House of GitHub. Um, if you're all familiar, Hype House is like the TikTok house uh, that all the TikTokers, I don't know if it's still around to be honest, but they all make content together. Uh, we collaborate together. Like Git, uh, the DevRel team continues to bring more people in the Hype House to hang out do content together, together, solve problems, um, see our goals achieved, uh, and basically spin off new, new champions of the product. And the theme that I'm also reading from you is what I find the most impactful in developer advocacy is solve real problems, do things that you care about, and then show how to use the product to solve it. Like your example with the uh, updating the fork is a great kind of the kind of the, the beacon of what that should be like because you have these two different camps of developer relations where one is we're just going to be an arm of marketing. We're going to take a product and say, Hey, this product launched this new feature, go use this. It's so great. And that doesn't really tell a story. It's just kind of, you know, yeah, it's, it's a feature. It's whatever versus somebody else is coming in. And here's how I use this feature to build this, I don't know, Lego robot that does this thing. And you're like, this is cool. Sign me up. Yeah, and it's just being in the right place, exposure. So I joked about serendipity, but it is about serendipity. So if I happen to be following all the most impactful customers on our platform, and then they tweet out and say, hey, I'd love to like go on a stream and talk about my open source project, uh, which actually happened. The reason why Evan Yu is on, was on Open Source Friday, I, it, it's funny because I knew Evan. We'd actually chatted. We'd been on calls before previously uh, and talk about features. But I happened to see him on Twitter and be like, hey, I want to talk about my new project, Veep. I was like, hey, why don't you join me? Uh, I do Open Source Friday. Uh, we have availability this Friday because it was like the beginning of the year. 
Uh, and I was like, t- I was trying to take a break, but I was like, you know, if Evan wants to come on, I'll make space for him. Uh, in two days, we turned around, uh, got him on stream, got him prepped. Uh, and then it just went basically for 60 minutes to show the demo of V. And I just asked all the questions. We took questions from the audience. Uh, and he thanked me for that because uh, he wasn't, I don't think he still, he doesn't stream right now, but he just wanted to stream and share this because there was no conferences. And going back to my original point, uh, the fact that there were no conferences, he didn't have a place to basically announce <laughs> this new thing, which is Veet, uh, which actually Veet 2.0, Veet had been around for a bit, uh, but Veet 2.0 was going to get launched literally the week after. Um, so he just wanted to like showcase it, talk through it, get some feedback live. And we had like 450 people show up, which again, is not the, really the number that matters. Uh, but what, what, what did matter is that Evan showed up on the podcast, the, the Read Me podcast, uh, and it, having that connection made it easier to get Evan on the podcast as well. What drew you personally to developer advocacy? It's it's funny. What drew me was uh, the founders of Netlify said I should be an advocate. Uh, it, it's I joined as an engineer, uh, and I had a goal uh, to give a talk on stage because I gave one talk, and I just wanted more opportunity to give a talk on stage. So the work I did at Netlify like fueled into me wanting to do more talks talk more about React at the time. React was sort of up and coming. Uh, it'd been around for a couple of years, but it, the, the adoption really started taking off when I joined Netlify. Uh, so it got it came to the point where there was a direct correlation between user growth and uh, every time I st- spoke on stage or wrote a blog post. So they asked me to basically to become full-time advocate. So I was doing like half and half, writing engineering, basically not even half and half, 100% and 100%. I was writing blog posts and I was also shipping features. Uh, and I was giving talks like on nights and weekends and stuff like that. So they asked me to become a full-time advocate. I actually told them no, because I did not want to leave engineering full-time. Uh, and then six months later, we hired a second front-end person to take care of the UI and the, the React code. Uh, so at that point, I was like, you know what? I'll just go ahead and do, like the company was up and coming. They had uh, almost about uh, grabbed their, um, basically closed their Series A at that point. So I said, you know what? Let's just drive growth. Let's just see if we can ride this rocket ship, which is a startup. So I spent a year uh, working as an advocate at Netlify full-time. Uh, I spoke like about 50 times that year, did tons of workshops, uh, flew across the country. Uh, and then at that point, GitHub hired me to do it full-time because at that point I, I convinced myself, this is what I want to do. Out of all the kind of the multitude of probably requirements that you have for being an advocate, what are the skills that make one stand out? Like, you know, public speaking, probably one. What else? I would, I'll, I'll name a couple skills, but it all just comes down to the ability to create other advocates. So if you're an advocate and you create other people who are just excited about the product as you are, uh, well, one, you have to be excited about the product. You got to be able to talk about it and like people to be, feel the authenticity and be excited enough to also go talk about it as well. So it's at, at the point that you can create advocates from y- your stuff that you do or the engagements that you do day to day you basically have made it. So if it's public speaking, that's a great way to sort of empower and excite people. Uh, I would also say like being in front of a camera, doing YouTube, doing podcasts, like that is a skill set that I think a lot of people are sort of really leveling up. Uh, It's something I've been doing for years. Um, I've had my own podcast for years. I've done YouTube uh, off and on for the past couple of years as well. And uh, it's a skill set that I think is it's going to show more and more of the need as we start to continue to do down this rabbit hole of uh, remote stuff only. Uh, but also just like written word. If, I, if you're not a public speaker, that's totally fine. If you could write words and share a story, that's also very valuable uh, because it's also going to, uh, in our docs on GitHub, we have the idea of guides. We have a, a ton of them, but that stuff, a lot of my my team members will help start helping up with that in the, the future. Uh, but those guides are going to be written words, actual stories, features that actually have a story attached to them, uh, being able to share those. And I think if, if you could be, if you can, one, develop other advocates, but also do it in different ways that you shine and en- engage uh, users, then you're, you're good to go. Uh, a lot of folks are really good at doing events, but I think as you start doing events, you, you start losing some of the uh, the focus on what your day-to-day is. Like, So you should be able to at least, you know, call up a caterer if you need like an in-person event or host a meetup or MC a conference. Like those are all a really good skill set, but not all necessary. Uh, it's all stuff that you can learn as you go along. So let's say somebody wants to learn to become an advocate. Where should they start? Like what's, what's the place? Because if I'm a developer, 
I can start coding. If I'm a product manager, I can probably look for some talks and figure out how to better build things as a product leader. What about a developer advocate? Yeah, I mean, it starts with like actually doing the work before you, so I, I became an advocate while I was already being an advocate. Like I was an engineer, I liked writing blog posts, I liked speaking on stage, and I made goals to actually get on stage. Uh, and there's like tips and tricks on like how to submit a CFP and actually get it accepted. Uh, Colby Fayok actually has, uh, I don't know if he's been on this, this show before, but he, sh he should be on. Uh, but he wrote a whole CFP template um, ebook on how to like craft your CFP to get it noticed. Like those are all skills that you'll pick up on the way. Uh, but you'll only be exposed to that by being a part of a community. So like, if you're not part of an existing community, uh, it's going to be very hard <laughs> to, to start from zero and become an advocate. So like, think about the Code Newbie community, easy community to advocate in. There's a ton of people just want to learn how to code. So if you can advocate and teach people how you learn how to code or how to learn how to code by doing, you know, step one, two, three of JavaScript or .NET or C Sharp or whatever it is, like do that first, create content, create talks create engagement opportunities uh, and then to answer the question maybe the answer that everybody's looking for there's a new um uh i don't know startup business i don't know organization i'm, I'm not even sure yet but it's called devocat devocate um which it's a it's a place for to sh share tips and tricks for a developer advocacy um they just started in the last uh, couple months uh there's some that have been around forever like the devrelcon uh work uh, DevRelCon being the uh, the conference that all the advocates go to. We all talk shop and learn about the best practices. Uh, it's run by this uh, consultancy called Hoopy. Uh, they do a newsletter as well. Uh, and then uh, Mary uh, Ther Therengolf. Anyway, there's a, uh, a developer advocate book that uh, Mary had uh, written. I don't know why I'm, I'm struggling in her last name. But it's not that hard. But um, definitely, uh, maybe if you have show notes, I can provide a link to that book as well. It seems like there's way more resources now than say five years ago. If somebody would, you know, be breaking yeah. it to Dev. <laughs> I remember specifically listening to a podcast, uh, the Change Log podcast, uh, talking about advocacy at Google, because uh, I think Google is probably one of the developer advocates have been around. The evangelists have been around for since Apple. Actually, Apple uh, Guy Kawasaki was the one of the first people to start the sort of Apple user groups, go around the country, get people to like fall in love with Apple and create other advocates in different cities. Like that's a whole model that's been in existence since the 80s. Uh, but I feel like Google is like who really took it seriously with the Chrome and getting folks to really, really engage Google products uh, as developers. Um, and that interview, that podcast on the change log kind of went through of like what people do and how they do it. Uh, and like some of that's changed, some hasn't. But I think what that did, and that, that podcast is like 2013, 2014-ish, uh, it, it encouraged more people to do the advocate thing and less of like the growth hacking thing. And I think growth hacking was like a, the predecessor to a lot of the startup focuses where like you just try to get your product at South by Southwest and get everybody to use it at the same time. Um, that's a thing you could still do, but like you're basically, you're, uh, if you don't do it right, it's very easily a great way to like lose customers and have people never use pr your product ever again. That's uh, also the tricky balance that yeah. acquiring new customers might be the easy part. It's getting them to stick is where now like the rubber meets the road and now you need to actually do the work because you can buy as many ads as you want. You can buy, you know, street uh, these big billboards that says go to this website and like, yeah, you'll, you'll drive traffic, but so what? It's um, so I did a whole series, Heavy Bit. Uh, it's a place that hosts my uh, podcast, Heavy Bit Network, uh, but it's also an accelerator. And they, I did a talk about onboarding, and it's something that not a lot of people think about pretty early in the product. Like they get a product to work, to get users, to get large enterprise customers, but then all the sort of individual users who just want to sign up for a free account. Like I'm, so, I'm kind of like shocked that so many dev, dev tools that just don't have a free account. Uh, it's like, what are we doing here? Like, how do you get people enticed? Like, how do you convince the enterprise customers or the the CTOs that their their engineering team wants to use this thing? Like, you're missing on an opportunity. I get sometimes it doesn't make sense to do that, and people want to have the big the the whales, the big deals, so that way they can get acquired or whatever. But if I find out about your product and I spend six hours trying to get it set up or just trying to build the first thing. It's not a great experience. It's a reason why I'll never go back to that product ever again. Even if you change it, uh, you'll have to remean the product at that point, or someone else will have to convince me from like a talk on stage that they've they've done it better. But like the thing that the reason why the deploy the Netlify button was a thing is because we wanted to be able to say by the time you've heard of Netlify, 
you've already found the template on GitHub, you've clicked the button, you already have a site in 60 seconds. And we made sure that the templates were 60 second templates. They weren't like the big hefty giant compile everything. It was like, you have a site in 60 seconds. You've got the concept, you got the idea, now go run with it and go tell the rest of your team that you should be using Netlify. Uh, it's the same thing with GitHub. GitHub, when we first, when I first joined, uh, we spent a lot of time not focusing on the onboarding experience at GitHub. Uh, we had a whole teams just like paper cuts that were focused on just sort of onboarding. Because uh, a lot of the onboarding experience for GitHub was all offloaded off the platform. And actually I covered this in my heavy bit talk. And uh, so GitHub, GitHub's a power tool. Git is even more of a power tool. So if you make all the assumptions that you have to know Git, then a lot of folks, they need that sort of that ramp up, especially brand new developers. So we had to take control of that in certain ways. So that way, uh, as you, if you've probably noticed, like GitHub, we have a really good UI. And there's a lot of stuff you could do in the UI that you had to do locally uh, on the command line, things like merge conflicts and et cetera, uh, that now we're trying to build a better experience for folks to engage the platform and not necessarily always go back into the command line to do things. Like if you want to use a command line, you're good to go. We've got a CLI as well. Uh, but for folks who are just like, all I want to do, I'm a designer. <laughs> all I want to do is actually review these designs, upload stuff. Why can't I upload a video onto GitHub? Or why can't I get a proper image in here and have conversation about these designs or a link. Maybe you need to link back to Figma. We've got integrations now that connect the Figma to GitHub. Um, those were stuff that's community driven, partner driven, but they were pain points that we had with conversation. Love it. And I love learning about developer relations from you, Brian. And I have a question. So for folks that are listening to this, they're new in their careers, they're still deciding on their career track. What's one piece of uncommon advice you'd give them that is not, well, I'll put it this way, that you discovered yourself that you did not necessarily kind of learn from a blog post or YouTube video, something that came from experience? The one piece of advice is that the, there's a lot of people who are really good developers that you probably have never heard of, uh, and that's completely fine. But I think there's a, a, a way to sort of shortcut or even like this sort of rock, add rocket fuel to your career trajectory which is by putting yourself out there. So like having an open source project and publicly talking about it is a great way to get your next job or to get an interview. Um, I, was, I, I do this podcast called the Review Podcast and we talked to a bunch of projects about, or we talked to a bunch of people who built projects and find out the story behind that. And hands down, most people who sort of get trajectory, like you show up on Hacker News, someone posted you there, someone tweeted something about your project and you get exposure. Uh, there's so many good ideas that people, even brand new developers are like solving, but they just never talk about it. And the best thing you can do is actually talk about the things you're doing, write a blog post. It's not, the, the intention is not, you don't need people to read it, but what happens is like ex every interview, like you do the whiteboarding, everybody over indexes on how to do whiteboarding interviews, how to get that job that, that way. But when you have like the soft skill conversations, like tell me a time you failed. Like if you wrote a blog post of how you failed making an open source project, you already have the answer. Or tell me a time you succeeded or tell me a time you worked with a team that wasn't your team. Well, I actually, I wrote a whole blog post on this. So like what I did in my early in my career and the part of the reason why I got pushed into DevRel is because I would always write stories about when I failed and succeeded. And I would never, I would never paint like a beautiful picture on it. I was just basically for me to know what the story was when I got there, I would just write it out as a blog. And uh, for years, no one read it. And then the people who read it were the people who reached out to me and said, hey, we've been reading your blog post. Uh, we're working on a product and we'd love for you to come work as an engineer at this company. Uh, and I was like, oh, cool. And that was that company was Netlify. They reached out to me directly because I was hosting my blog on Netlify. And I wouldn't have been in that position if I wasn't sharing my story. And you just never know who's going to read it. Like if you try to do the whole growth hacking, put it in front of people, tweet it, be very spammy on Reddit and stuff like that. Like that's cool, but like just write stuff. And if it's good enough, people will find it. Uh, if it's really good, people will share it. It's the 10 year overnight success. Exactly. It's the stuff where it's like, we were talking to Scott Hanselman, like at the beginning of the year, this is the exact same thing. It's like for the longest time, nobody listens to you up until one point where it goes just up. Yes. Yeah. And he's, he's sitting on 30, 30 years of just constantly just doing stuff, not necessarily for the the fame or the notoriety like he just had a story to talk about and like what i love about scott is that he's been sharing like all these old gadgets and like palm pilots and stuff like that and like also super nintendo just recently on tiktok randomly 
he just has a story to talk about all these old gadgets and these old this old tech because he's just been around maybe at the time no one really cared but now everybody's like oh wow this is like a historian live like this human being who just happened to be around for the longest time can talk about to ad nauseum about anything within tech within the last 30 years Right. And see, again, back to the original point, like Scott doesn't come off as somebody that tries to sell you on things. It's like, there's some cool stuff I care about. And here's how I did it. Yeah, it, it doesn't always need to be some sort of hype. And I think there's a lot of new developers who, um, it, it always shows too as well, like there's a lot of gurus uh, like on YouTube and TikTok and Twitter um, who like, they're not selling you, but they're also really selling you like a bill of goods of like, this is how I became a JavaScript ninja. And I get the reasoning for that where you sort of set yourself up, but I think your code will speak for more, like way more further than what you, you need to actually go and sell on, on TikTok or Twitter. And the folks who are like, they're just turning around, learning how to code and then creating a course themselves. Um, I don't mean to like speak ill for everybody. Like if you're doing this, like definitely do it the right way. Like have some sort of authenticity underneath because that's the authenticity is what stuff like as soon as you really get knees deep into like a tutorial or inside of someone's blog uh, and the authenticity disappears, like people just start drifting away. And then there's always this land grab of trying to get people back. And I think if you want to be an advocate, if you want to just be an engineer who writes blogs, like just be authentic, like authentic to yourself. Like, would you read this? Would you participate in this content? Would you use this product? Um, and if the answer is yes, then keep going. Talk, talk, continue to talk about it. Brian, where can folks find you online and learn more about your adventures, your podcast, your community work? Yeah, yeah. If you want to know about DevRel and developer advocacy, I've got a newsletter called subscribe.bwlive. It it's, goes to my, my actual website, bwlive. Uh, I actually specifically only talk about tips and tricks for DevRel in that one space. Uh, and it's mainly because like not everybody really cares about like, you know, the behind the scenes and how to like, you know, success of some YouTube series that I did. Uh, so specifically the newsletter is where I talk about that. Uh, if you're just interested in things like GitHub, the GitHub YouTube channel is a great place. Uh, I also have my own personal YouTube channel, uh, which is BDuggy. Uh, perhaps there'll be linked somewhere, uh, in some show notes, but, uh, I talk about this tech that I'm working on developer tools, just try stuff out. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much everywhere as B-Duggy on the internet as well. Excellent. And we'll, of course, include all the links in the show notes so folks can just uh, look below in the description for more details. Uh, Brian, thank you so much for being with us today. Pleasure.